G'day everyone, welcome to Lubrication Explained. In today's video we're going to talk about dispersants. Specifically we'll do a review of detergents, um, we'll look at dispersant chemistry and we'll also look at the activity of dispersants in a lubricating oil. So if you'll remember from our previous two videos on detergents and overbase detergents, these are surfactants, so surface um, acting agents. And what they functionally do is they have a, a polar head and a non-polar tail. So remember, um, hydrophilic means it's you know attracted to water, but water is a polar substance, and so the head is attracted to other polar substances. And hydrophobic means a, a non-polar tail. Now you remember oil is non-polar, so this tail will kind of want to bond with the oil, whereas the head will want to bond with polar. Um, you know, contaminants, polar additives, metal surfaces, things like that. All right, if you remember um, how that actually looked in practice was if we had bulk oil and we had a water molecule or you can substitute any polar molecule in here, then all of those kind of detergent additives are gonna be attracted to it and encapsulated. Why is that important? Well, if you can imagine um, soot, right? So soot is a, is a really big deal when it comes to engines. Um, soot comes from uncombusted fuel products and it enters the crankcases blow by. So what I mean by that, okay, we've got combustion above the, the top of the cylinder and we're going to get some blow by gases that make it past the compression and oil rings. So that's how um, some of the um, uncombusted fuel might make it into the crankcase. When it does so, soot it is itself polar, so it is the kind of the analogue of, of water. And soot by itself, these soot particles are very, very small, and by themselves, they're actually not harmful, right? As soot gradually builds up in the system, though, what soot likes to do is it likes to what's called agglomerate together. You've got to remember that these are all polar contaminants, and so polar attracts polar, so like attracts like. And these soot particles are going to slowly agglomerate together, and they basically form an abrasive sand particle, right? So this is gonna be really bad from an engine wear perspective, right? So soot can be really damaging to engine components from a wear perspective. But also when you start to get lots and lots of soot particles in your oil, it's what's called soot loading, that can also increase the viscosity of the oil as well. So it's a combination of uh, modification to the viscosity as well as uh, modification to the wear properties of the oil as well. That's what makes soot so dangerous. All right, so how can dispersants play a role in this? Well, these two um, soot particles want to connect together, right? So the dispersant molecules are able to encapsulate them, right? Now the polar, um, uh, the activity is basically reduced, right? Because there's no way for these soot molecules to interact with each other because there are dispersant molecules that are in the way. So that's what prevents what we call the agglomeration of soot particles. So let's talk a little bit about detergents versus dispersants because they are very similar in their structure, but they have slightly different um, objectives and slightly different properties. So on the detergent side, which we've already learned, we learned that overbased detergents help to neutralize acids, right? That's one of the functions of these overbase detergent molecules, right? So if you remember, there's calcium carbonate or some other base material in the middle of a micelle and the, the surrounding detergent molecules act as a transport mechanism. Detergents also help to prevent deposits. So they go around and clean different engine components, right? The other thing is detergents are, um, are quite attracted to metal surfaces because they have that polar head. Um, and that's part of the way that they're able to clean surfaces is they displace deposits. Dispersants have a slightly different um, objective. One of the things that they do is they solubilize um, sludge and other sludge precursors. And they also prevent particle agglomer agglomeration, which is what I just talked about. So what does this all actually mean in practical senses? If you had to distill it down to something very basic, detergents kind of grab um, acids and neutralize them, and they clean surfaces, and they also grab contaminants and take them to the filter to be removed. What dispersants do is they hold things in suspension and prevent them from sticking together. So by holding something in suspension for a very long time, it effectively waits until the oil drain 
and then when you drain the oil is when the contaminants are removed. All right, so what do the chemistries look like? Well, detergents tend to be high in ash because they contain metals, right? So often they'll contain, um, you know, a barium or an aluminium or a calcium or a magnesium, whereas dispersants don't, right? They tend to be low or no ash products. Detergents are very basic, right? So we overbase detergents to give them that um, uh, capacity to neutralize acids, whereas dispersants are either very slightly basic or pretty much neutral. Detergents are highly polar, so they usually have like a metal head to them, um, whereas dispersants are a little bit polar, but not as polar as detergents. Um, detergents have a low molecular weight, but as you'll see when we talk about how you make a dispersant, these tend to be much larger molecules. They have a much higher molecular weight, and that helps with um, their capacity to solubilize contaminants. On the detergent side, we have lower emulsivity, um, and on the dispersant side, we have higher emulsivity, and that's partly because of that very, very long um, hydrocarbon tail, right? It means that it bonds very strongly with the oil that are around, is around it. Detergents, um, very good from a rust protection standpoint, whereas dispersants, not so much. So detergents are able to um, protect against rust, one, because they neutralize acids, right? And acids are corrosive. Um, but also because they're able to clean metal surfaces of oxides and things like that. So um, slightly different function there. All right, now let's talk about the manufacture of these dispersant molecules, because if you'll remember from our previous videos, making a detergent was an acid-base reaction. So you took an organic acid, which was also co called a substrate, you reacted it with a metal base, so that could have been a, a, a hydroxide or um, you know a carbonate, and what you got was a metal detergent, so effectively a metal soap, plus some some water left over as well. Now, in the re taking um, a, a reaction of a dispersant, what you want is a long hydrocarbon chain. You want a connecting group, and that's going to connect you to the functional polar head. All right. So, what does that look like? We have to adjust our picture of our detergent molecule, right, where we had the polar head and the nonpolar tail. And what we're going to do is we're going to insert a separate um, piece, which, um, you know, firstly, we're going to call that polar head is going to be a nitrogen or oxygen functional group, right, because rather than being metal containing, they have, um, you know, a nitrogen or oxygen based uh, structure. We have this connecting group, which connects that functional group to the nonpolar tail. And these two first components, the functional group and the connecting group, we're going to call that, I've never actually said this word, I've only ever seen it on a page, I think it's the polar moiety, um, but I'm sure someone will correct me in the comments section. All right, so let's take our long hydrocarbon chain, our connecting group and our functional group and see, okay, how does that work in practice? So the long hydrocarbon chain is usually made of polyisobutylene or an olefin, right? Um, so let's use the example of a PIV, right? So we're, what we're doing here is that we are building this long hydrocarbon tail, right? So this is what a, a PIB looks like. It's actually a polymer. So this little section in the middle um, could be repeated many, many times, right? So when I say it's a high molecular weight um, molecule, it's because the N here could be you know, 100 or something like that. There's, there's many, many, many um, carbons in this chain. Uh, we just don't want to write them out because obviously it would make it imperceptible. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to re react that with uh, what we call a maleic anhydride, right, which kind of looks like this. And when you react those two together, what you get is PIBSA. Um, I'm going to absolutely butcher this name, but this is a polyisobutylene succinamide succinamide. Is, I think that's right. Um, but we just call it PIBSA for short. Okay, so now I've got my uh, long hydrocarbon tail and I've got my connecting group. And so what I want is a functional group. Now these are either oxygen-based or nitrogen-based, right, for our, our polar molecule. The oxygen ones, you would react in alcohol, but for the nitrogen ones, you tend to um, react in amine. Right, so let's use the example of an amine and we'll use uh, TEPA, right? Um, that's just tetra because there's, there's there's four of these chains, right? And when you do that reaction, what you get is something that connect 
can connect uh, two uh, PIBSA groups together to form what we call PIBC. All right. Now, that is the way that you build a dispersant. So remember, it's, it has very high molecular weight. Now, if we look at this kind of um, uh, molecule on paper, what we get is that the nitrogen in the middle is the polar group, right? So remember that the nitrogen-hydrogen bond is highly polar. So that's what's going to attract it to the contaminants. We've got a long hydrocarbon tails that go hydrocarbon tails that go off to either side. Right? That's what is, um, you know, going to be able to hold um, something in solution for a very long time. Because remember, we have to hold a contaminant in solution until we do an oil drain. Right? That's the purpose of a dispersant. So that's kind of functionally what it does. Now you can enhance the properties of, of a dispersant by, for example, adding metals, right? So if you kind of, you could add zinc for anti-wear or you could add some boron for anti-friction properties, things like that. But in doing so, you will create um, a, uh, a dispersant which creates ash when it's combusted, right? So you don't necessarily want to do that. Um, but they can kind of enhance the properties of dispersants by adding metals. Anyway, I hope that video has kind of given you uh, a good insight into uh, what a dispersant does and how it is subtly different from a detergent. Often you'll hear it referred to in the same sentence, so you might see it as a dispersant detergent package or something like that. Um, but anyway, um, if you've got questions or comments, please leave them down below. As usual, this has been Lubrication Explained.